So nobody has to tell us that we have done wrong. You know, your heart tells you that you've done wrong because God has built the system like that. But when you do right also, it gives a wonderful feeling. When you do right, the conscience assures you that all is well, that God is pleased and so on. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. polluted? Is your mind polluted? Is your thoughts polluted? Is it unclean? Now a lot of people haven't done anything wrong. Because pretty decent people. They respect the law and they want to do what is right. And So even if they have some inclinations to do something wrong, they don't want to do it. They try to keep away from doing it. But that doesn't mean that the heart is clean. And psalmist recognizes that God requires truth in the inward parts. God doesn't want just, abs just us abstaining from wrongdoing on the outside, but entertaining wrong things in the inward parts, in our hearts. God looks at sin differently. He says, have you got sin? And we say, no, no, no I've not done anything. He said, no, no, I didn't mean that. Have you got it in your heart? Have you got it in your mind? Is it in your thoughts? It is, in that, is it in that realm? Is it part of your life? Is it part of the way you think? Is it in your desires? Is it in the depth of your heart? Somewhere in there. Now, keep Psalm 51 right there, but go back to 1 John 1. 1 John 1, we read verse 7, right? But look at verse, verse 7 says, at the end, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's writing to the believers, mind you. When he says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, remember, these are sin-forgiven people. They are already made children of God. They are in the family of God. They are in the church. They're believers. 
and he tells them the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. So he's not talking about dealing with the sin issue and coming to God. It's talking about the, dealing with the pollution of sin, which is after you're forgiven and, and brought to God. When you live for God, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. And then it says, if we, have, if we say that we have no sin, and there are a lot of people that say that, because they don't understand the issue of sin. They say, well, I have no sin. I have not sinned. Look at the man across the street. He has sinned, but I have not sinned. What they're saying is, I have not done anything wrong. And the Bible says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And truth is not in us. When a person says, I have no sin, if anybody says, I have no sin at all, just because they think they have not done any sin, they really don't understand the issue. And here it says, if any man says that I have no sin, he deceives himself and truth is not in him. When a person says I have no sin, I have no sin at all, I'm clean, I'm no, I have no sin, he is an absolute liar. Nobody can say I have no sin. It's like saying in my house you cannot find one little speck of dirt or filth or dust in my whole house. Even if you looked with a microscope, you cannot find one little, you know, speck of dirt in my house. I would never say that. You'll find plenty of dirt. It's nonsense to say there is no dirt in my house. Because you live in a world full of dust and filth. It's flying all over the place. It will be there. You are, you are deceiving yourself if you think there's no dirt in your house. There is a plenty of Maybe you don't see it. When a man says he has no sin, he deceives himself. The truth is not in him, he says. So what is it saying? He says, in this world when you live, the, it is a world of sin. That's the reality. Sin is everywhere. You don't have to go very far and do anything wrong to get involved with sin. Sin is in the air. It's everywhere. It's like the dust that flies everywhere. It will creep in, it will come in somehow, it will find its way inside, into your thought, into your mind, into your desires, into your heart. It will find somehow a way to get into your life. You don't even know it's come in, but it has come in. That's what the Bible is teaching. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. The pollution of sin. In that way, all of us are constantly being polluted by sin. You can't say no. You say, well, brother, I'm just sitting here. I've not done anything wrong. Yeah, you're just sitting here, but what's going on in the mind? You know. Now go back to Psalm 51. The psalmist recognizes, Lord, I know. I know the issue of sin from your angle. It's not just what I have done. What I have done is wrong, surely wrong. But it's not just what I have done. From your angle, when I look at it, you desire truth in the inward parts. You want me to be true in my heart. You want my heart to be clean, which it is not, he says. You desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Now listen to this. Purge me with hyssop. Ah. And I shall be clean. Now he's coming from Leviticus 13 and 14 and Numbers 19. This is when Old Testament helps you. You know, he knows what Leviticus 13 and 14 talks about. If you read Leviticus 13 and 14 and Numbers 19, where it's talking about a person unclean because he has touched a dead body or a person is unclean because he's got leprosy. Talking about telling him, bring him to bring an offering for his sin. But then he's got to go bring some hyssop also in both cases. You know what hyssop is? On the Passover day when they first observed Passover, they shed the blood of the lamb and they used hyssop, which is a common plant that grew all over their land. And he's telling them to bring a bunch of that and to be used as a brush to dip it into the blood and smear the blood on the doorposts and the lintels on Passover day. 
when they first observed Passover, you remember Hyssop is mentioned there. Now, the story of Hyssop is not over with that. Hyssop is constantly mentioned in the scriptures. Here, in the cleansing procedure, Hyssop is a very important item that is needed. You got to bring a sacrifice, you got to kill the animal and all that, but then you got to bring a Hyssop. Tell him to bring a Hyssop, it says. You read those chapters. It says, bring a Hyssop. Why? Because hyssop is the thing that you use to sprinkle the blood and the water to bring about purification. So this is a real purification language, cleansing language used in the Old Testament and, and David is very familiar with that. He is familiar with all those procedures. So he says, Lord, purge me. Purge is simply cleanse. Cleanse me with hyssop. He's saying, let your purification happen. Blood and water were sprinkled. You know, for the leper, it was told that blood must uh, be taken and applied on his ears and hands and legs and whatnot, you know, so many places. It's all a picture of how we must be purified, not just by putting blood on our ears. It doesn't purify anything. But it's a picture. It's a teaching. What's wrong with the ears? Why they are told to put in there? Because the ear is a gateway through which the pollution, the impurity, the wrong things enter in as we sit and listen to the wrong things. The eyes, the hands, the legs, these are all involved in taking in the impurity and the dirt and the filth that is there in the world, the sin that is in the world. These are the gateways through which it goes. Our feet goes to the place where you do wrong. Our hand reaches out to do that which is wrong. Our ears must be cleansed because it wants to hear the wrong things. Our eyes must be cleansed because it wants to see the wrong. That's the, picture. That's the thing that the Old Testament is teaching. Old Testament is not some silly book talking about some kind of procedure for some silly cleansing. No, it is about the greater issue of sin. And the impurity of sin and how it must be cleansed, how great an issue it is. It's not around it. It must be treated like leprosy. That's the point there. How would you treat leprosy? That's the way you should treat it. First the person is quarantined. Then he's checked out. Then he's properly cleansed. He's got to take a bath and come. And then they'll sprinkle the thing all over him. If they're not sure, they can send him back seven days more again for quarantine. And then check him out again. He's got to shave himself head to toe and... Take a bath and then be sprinkled and so on. Why all this? Why these unnecessary, seemingly unnecessary procedures? It is because it is trying to tell us how dangerous the pollution of sin is. If you allow it, if you consider it as nothing, as no issue, how it will be become a disease and destroy you and literally kill you and ruin you completely. That's the, that's the thing that it is trying to teach. And the psalmist recognizes that. He says, Lord, purge me with hyssop. Declare me clean, please. Use that hyssop. Sprinkle that blood. And sprinkle, go through the cleansing procedure. And make me clean and declare me clean. It's important, he says. He says, cleanse me with hyssop. I shall be clean. He says, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And now listen to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit or right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Now that verse 10 is very important. Create in me a clean heart. He realizes what the issue is. He says, the problem with me is the heart is not clean. My thoughts are not clean. My intentions are not clean. My desire is not clean. My decisions are not clean, therefore. My imaginations are not clean. My understanding is not clean. I need a new heart, O oh God. I need a clean heart. Create. I don't want this heart. I want a brand new heart. Create in me a clean heart. I want a new heart because if I don't have a new heart, then I can't have a new life. 
what an amazing revelation he has right in the midst of his sin and the problem that he was undergoing and it's very clear that he is asking for more than just pardon from his sins that's why i read this he is not just asking saying lord i did two things please forgive me forget it no he is asking for something more he is asking for what is called cleansing which will really deal with it and cause him to live victorious though said so that he will not do it again if he only had a clean heart he says i'll i'll never do it because the clean heart will make me think clean decide clean things and do the right things give me a clean heart oh god he says now, i don't have the time to read the rest of it you may read the rest of it and it's a wonderful psalm to study there is so much of a revelation in it but the point is made here very clearly there is there is the issue of sin which must be solved in order for us to come to god but then there is an issue of pollution of sin two different things right when jesus died on the cross his blood was shed for the remission of our sin without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin that's the first issue our sin was paid for by his death and the blood shed was the proof that it was paid for but then the second issue is the cleansing and that also happens through the blood the work of the blood of jesus is not over with making atonement for our sins bringing us to god the work of the blood of jesus continues on as it continues to cleanse us as we live in this world amid the pollution of this world and constantly getting the dust and the impurity and the defilement of the world into our thoughts and lives into our hearts the blood constantly has to do the work of cleansing that's what it's all about now in the new testament the bible te- talks about cleansing a lot it starts with matthew's gospel chapter 5 verse 8 remember the sermon on the mount blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god it says but let me read to you 1 timothy chapter 5 i just want to read three two three verses uh because i want to show you how the new testament talks about cleansing and then i want to talk about how the cleansing happens 1 timothy chapter 1 verse 5 now the purpose of the commandment is love now here is a wonderful verse i like paul because in one verse he gives the meaning of the whole old testament or the whole 10 commandments what is the purpose of the commandment he says love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere and from sincere faith now how can you define it any better than that jesus narrowed it down the ten commandments down to two commandments ten commandments were given in the old testament jesus said you can reduce it to, to two and that is love the lord your god with all your heart mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as your self now paul brings it down to one he says the whole essence of the ten commandments is love but love cannot happen with our heart unchanged the problem with the people under the old covenant was the commandment was given but the ability to do what the commandment gave it told them was not there they could not do what the command because the heart was wrong the commandment is good paul says that in romans chapter 7 he says the commandment is good it's holy it's god's commandment it can't be it can't have anything wrong the commandment is god's commandment nothing is wrong with it but something wrong in me he says I found that there is something wrong in me what's wrong in me sin sin has polluted me there is no real love there is no real faith and there is no good conscience something wrong with my heart therefore even though the 10 commandment is good since my heart is not good i'm not able to do what the 10 commandment says he says so paul says here the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart now the new testament is about this new ability that has come to us because god now gives us a pure heart he takes away the old heart and gives us a new heart that's the new covenant the spe- the special uh, thing in the new covenant is it does something that the old covenant was not able to do and that is it gives us a new heart god says i'll take away the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh he says a pliable heart a heart that will listen the heart that will, that will obey the heart that will walk in the ways of god so that's the new covenant 
So Paul says that's you know pure heart. But Paul talks about pure heart. Now Titus chapter two, verse fourteen. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself. See why did he give himself on the cross of Calvary? So that he may redeem us from every lawless deed. So that our whole life and our actions may be changed ultimately. And purify for himself. Once again the cleansing is there. Purify is a word that comes from the word cleansing. Purify for himself his own special people. Zealous for good works. This is why Jesus died he says ultimately. So that he can redeem us from every lawless deed. And purify for himself a people for good works. All right. Now, Second Corinthians, one last verse I'll read. Second Corinthians, chapter seven, verse one. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. See, because we have promises, these promises, Paul says, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, he's writing to believers. He says, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. He's telling the believers, hey, your sins are forgiven. God doesn't see your sin. He has accepted you, received you as his child. But you're living in this world. The world is full of the pollution of sin. It is, it's like dust all over the place. Dirt and impurity all over the place. As you live in this world, somehow the filthiness of sin that is there in the world, in every realm, everywhere. The world is full of it. It somehow gets into you. It becomes a part of your flesh and spirit. That means flesh and heart. It gets into your system. It gets into your way of thinking. It gets into your way of believing. It gets into your way of doing things. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from that. Let's make sure that we deal with it as we live in this world. Now, how does this happen in the New Testament? We know Jesus shed his blood on the cross, made an atonement for our sins. Father has accepted us, forgiven our sins. But how do we deal with the pollution of sin? Now, it starts with the conscience. The blood of Jesus acting upon our conscience, cleansing our conscience. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. And notice here, the statement about our conscience and how our conscience is cleansed. 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Dead works are those works that are not done in faith in God, in the power of God, in obedience to God, to please God. For the glory of God. Anything that is done. Anything that is done for any other purpose. Other than that to glorify God. To please God. As the will of God. In obedience to God. Is dead works. Now I am just quickly giving you a definition. But it comes from the rest of the Bible. And what it teaches. What it teaches. The Bible teaches in other places. In Hebrews chapter 6. And other places about dead works. Dead works. oftentimes are many religious things that people do. Uh, religious rituals and religious ceremonies, and religious duties and things that people do. They do it sincerely, but it's called dead works. The Bible teaches us saying that these are dead works. These works are dead works. Now, our conscience is cleansed from dead works to serve the living God. To serve the living God means so that we may live for God. Now, our conscience is cleansed. Now, it's very important for, for us to understand how important, how the conscience works. The conscience has been kept inside us as a alarm, is probably the better way to say it. Like an alarm. As soon as you do wrong, it starts ringing. Have you ever found that? <laughs> and you try to stop it and say, Phew, stop that thing. I want to sleep peacefully. I don't want to think about it. You can't stop it. This thing goes off and it won't let you sleep. This alarm is on. You've done something wrong. It'll speak loud and clear, tell you 
it's made like that you see the moment you do something wrong it's going to go off you think you can turn it off this is not your alarm that you got by the bedside this is inside your heart you can't turn it off it's going to go on and on and on it's going to disturb you day and night it's never going to let you sleep it's never going to let you rest when you do wrong god has put you know nobody has to tell us that we have done wrong you know your heart tells you that you've done wrong because god has built the system like that but when you do right also it gives a wonderful feeling when you do right the conscience assures you that all is well that god is pleased and so on in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand there are pleasures evermore you surround us with your favor oh lord the earth is full of your goodness the earth is filled with your your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand there are pleasures evermore you surround us with your favor oh lord the earth is full of your goodness the earth is filled Exceeding